To navigate us through this minefield are Oliver Gower, who's Deputy Director of the National Cyber Crime Unit at the National Crime Agency, and Cal Leeming, who's a former hacker. So please welcome them both to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Oliver Gower. Uh, yes, I'm the Deputy Director of the National Cybercrime Unit in the National Crime Agency. Uh, first thing to say is it's a real pleasure um, to be here today and thank you to Gavin and to the organisers for inviting, for inviting me and for more importantly placing this topic um, on the agenda, a topic that merits and demands um, a slot on this agenda and, and our time. So as someone who arrived here today, uh, you don't need to have been here to be fully aware of one of the key messages that emer is emerging, has emerged from this conference, which is one of growing demand on law enforcement's collective resources set against significant financial constraint. So in the next 20 minutes, I am going to be very direct about adding to that list of demands. Um, but I'm also going to offer some incentives uh, and set out some opportunities for your organisations um, for better protecting the public and actually for your own careers as leaders and future senior leaders of UK policing. Because what's at stake here is the continued relevance of law enforcement to the modern crime threat. And I can guarantee it will be the individuals in this room who embrace uh, this subject, who leave this room and push this agenda, who agitate with colleagues and seniors, it will be those individuals who uh, put themselves in the best position to be tomorrow's chief constables. So I'm going to cover three things. First, what is cybercrime and what's the scale of the problem? Second, what is the state of the current response? And finally, what do you need to do as part of a UK-wide system response uh, in order to rise to this challenge and effectively protect your communities from 21st century crime? Uh, because just as cybercrime uh, being delivered exclusively through the internet uh, is inherently networked and borderless, so our response must be seamless from local to regional to national and international, and we share a collective responsibility to work together, no matter which force or which agency, um, to deliver against this threat. So many of you will have heard, and we just heard them, some of them repeated, the plethora of facts and figures um, around the scale of the threat, but it is worth taking a moment just to consider those because they are so vast. As we've heard, online fraud, now the most, common, um, most prominent crime recorded in the country according to the uh, crime survey, 5.6 million computer misuse act or online fraud offences. Tenth of the population reports having been a victim. 84% of people had experienced some form of attempted cybercrime in the past year. Uh, the number of UK businesses suffering an attack doubled um, in the past year. Almost half of firms, 65% of large firms. As a kind of example, it costs about $38 an hour on average to launch a DDoS attack against the business, shutting down their online services. Um, but the average cost of that is around $40,000 an hour. So are there many small businesses within your communities that could survive for an hour a day with that kind, under that kind of attack? And the estimates we've heard, uh, they vary, many of them up into the tens of billions. Certainly we see individual um, organised crime campaigns that raise hundreds of millions globally. And the raid on the Bangladeshi bank um, stole around $88 million. So crime wave would be an understatement. This is a transition from offline to online. And as the former head of the National Security Agency said, cybercrime is the greatest trans transfer of wealth in history. Is it hyperbole? Is it a, a spike that's going to subside? I don't think so. Absolutely not. Four in five homes have internet access. Online retail is now 2.6 billion a year and looking to grow 30% year on year. 85% of all business assets are in a digital form. And with the rise of the Internet of Things, with internet connected devices all through our homes, in our central heating, fridges, lorries, um, all over the place, it stands to good reason that this crime will continue to rise. So that may or may not have been news to you. Um, what is absolutely clear is that our communities and the public are now placing as much emphasis on this crime as they are on traditional crime. 
So with 12,000 residents surveyed in the 2016 Southeast Cybercrime uh, Survey, the majority now believe that online crimes are of equal seriousness to physical crimes. The majority recognise the risk to them from cybercrime and are concerned about those risks. So what this tells us, cybercrime is not an invisible threat. It's not victimless. Those millions of estimated cyber attacks translate into victims in your communities and, fed, and f spread fear about the online risks and damage our digital economies locally and nationally. And if there's millions happening, then they're happening in your communities, in the communities that you serve, possibly right now, at a significant scale. So what exactly are we talking about? Um, the term cyber means different things to different people. Fundamentally, the internet is a digital environment that's changing the way criminals operate. Just like the land, the sea, the air, the internet is another domain within which criminals research targets, communicate, uh, process their financial transactions, trade, conspire. So this framework you might fi may find useful um, sets out the full range of cyber from the digital footprint that records a criminal's online lifestyle to cyber facilitated crimes like the sale of drugs or online paedophilia to cyber enabled crime which could happen in the real world but is transformed in its scale and reach such as fraud. And finally cyber dependent crime which is the focus of my presentation today. So this last category, how does it manifest? So the NCA and policing identify four key threats to the, NCA, to the UK, which you can see at the top of that slide. Our long-term focus has been on the use of malicious software to hoover up credentials through the use of uh, enormous botnets of infected computers which talk to each other and operate in a network across the globe serving those criminal needs, maybe without those, uh, the owners of those computers even realising they're doing it. They will host malicious software, the likes of Game Over Zeus, Shylock, or more recently, Drydex, Dyreza, some of which you may have heard of. They hoover up credentials, which can then be used to commit fraud on an unprecedented scale. We've also focused on major intrusions, network intrusions, um, where criminals are burrowed away deep into a business in order to steal data. So for instance, the hacks of 3Mobile, Camelot, Tesco's, but in recent years, the threat of denial of service extortion, i.e. shutting down a business's online services until they pay up, or ransomware, um, which demands a payment of a ransom in order to decrypt files, we've seen those threats rise and escalate in what is a trend of cyber becoming far more visible and far more confrontational. Partly, this is driven by the greater efficiency of this as a criminal business model. Um, deploying those tactics requires fewer moving parts. You don't need money mules if you're demanding money directly from the customer for pay, for, to, from the victim um, directly through Bitcoin. Lower overheads for the criminals. And the past year has been punctuated by cyber attacks on a scale and boldness not seen before. The largest ever recorded cyber heist, the largest DDoS attack ever seen, knocking off huge swathes of infrastructure in the US and Europe and the biggest ever data breach. So this is driven, this is underpinned by a complex network and marketplace of criminal services that you see in that second batch there. Services for money uh, monetizing the threat, services for developing malware. And this is what a, um, an online OCG now looks like, an online cyber OCG. So what you see is an intricate mix of technical sophisticated skill sets with traditional capabilities. So a, uh, an organized crime group leader will hire someone to develop a new piece of code. There are then platforms and systems for them to test that piece of code against to make sure it can evade all the antivirus systems. They'll then hire someone to look at ways of delivering it. Do they want to do it through spamming? Do they want to do it through infected advertising, malvertising? Then they'll set up a network to monetize that, to take those stolen credentials and turn them into cash, maybe purchase assets and send the money back to the OCG. So this is an integrated and uh, sophisticated web of skills, technical and traditional. That's what the criminals do, and that is exactly what we need to deliver as law enforcement. So we focused very much um, collectively, and I have so far, on the financial impact of cybercrime. 
But on the 12th of May this year, um, the real world impact was realised and widely recognised in the public conscience for the first time. So the WannaCry ransomware infection spread laterally across computer systems, targeting uh, computers randomly around the globe. As was widely reported, it appeared to fuse a weapons-grade worm for spreading with a, um, a piece of ransomware code to devastating effect. So that in itself was remarkable and it had a remarkable impact. Um, but the two things that I draw out from that attack was what kind of impact it had. It had a real world impact on victims, not just financial. So hospitals in many of your force areas were disrupted. According to this article, 8,000 uh, patients were disrupted across four sites, but we know the NHS uh, had a total of around 47 sites affected. So do the maths in terms of the number of people that are likely to have been disrupted by this. Operations were canceled. People were turned away from A&E. GP surgeries were closed. This was a kinetic cyber attack on the scale of which we have not seen in this country. It joins the ranks of the attacks on Parliament that happened recently, the attack on Tesco Bank, the, some of you may have seen the, the Petcha or not Petcha ransomware attack that devastated businesses across, across the globe in June. And this has shone a spotlight on cybercrime, not just as a financial harm, but in terms of disrupting our daily lives. And being at the centre of responding to those attacks, I can tell you that it certainly feels that it's ramping up. It does not feel that this is going away. It feels that we are on a, a journey um, and that this is the beginning of a journey. The second most remarkable thing and slightly more encouraging, very, very much more encouraging, is the response that we collectively delivered. So I had the privilege of being the gold commander of, on, on that um, response, the gold commander for law enforcement on responding to the WannaCry attack. Um, the response was remarkable. It was a truly joined up law enforcement effort that shows what we're capable of doing together. So the NCA led the investigation in support of the National Cybersecurity uh, Centre. Uh, the ROCUs deployed to NHS sites to um, help victims, but also to preserve evidence and forensic material. City of London Police focused on protect advice and on uh, maintaining their uh, action fraud service with a likely upsurge in public concern. And the National Police Operations Centre briefed chief constables and PCCs and was on standby to mobilise police should the situation have degraded um, even further. So we worked as part of one gold group um, daily, multiple briefings daily, fed directly by the NCSC, by the Cybersecurity Centre, and coordinating across the national and regional levels to help stem the spread of that infection and to um, build an evidential case. But the message from WannaCry was clear. Cybercrime affects our local communities in the most fundamental ways, but we are able to respond very effectively if we work together. The challenge to us all is to deliver that response, not just when there is a national emergency, but to do it in an ongoing uh, business as usual way that this threat, this continuous threat demands. There's no point tackling this problem in isolation. You need access to the same technical capabilities to investigate this crime. You need consistent prevention advice to share. You need the same approach to deterring youngsters in your area who may be tempted down this path. You need access to each other's information in different force areas because cybercrime is inherently borderless and connected. And a cybercrime in your area will undoubtedly have victims elsewhere in the UK, undoubtedly have perpetrators somewhere else and data that you need somewhere else. So it demands an integrated response. And that's exactly what the NCA and Peter Goodman, the chief constable, the national policing lead for cyber, have been building. So this is the model that describes the roles and responsibilities across UK law enforcement. City hold that dual function of being the national reporting portal for cyber and the national protect lead. NCA lead against the most serious cyber threats and support and coordinate the broader UK effort. The regions with their dedicated cyber teams lead cases into complex multi-jurisdictional investigations um, and have dedicated prevent and protect roles. They're integrated into a national system that is um, coordinated between myself and Peter Goodman. And locally, there are clear responsibilities to lead the response to cyber at a local level, to investigate NFIB disseminations, to provide protect advice to victims and those who are vulnerable in your communities, and to feed the national picture. 
This is what this looks like as a tasking model. Last year's National Police um, NPCC approved this set of uh, this approach. So the National Police Chiefs, uh, Chiefs Council approved the delineation of responsibilities that set out on this slide and on the previous one. It approved a national tasking model for cyber to enable a common process for triage and tasking. Specifically, the NPCC agreed to the joint NPCC and NCA tasking of ROCQ assets as a nationally networked resource against cybercrime. So on a monthly basis, I chair that meeting with Pete Goodman. And this has created a Team Cyber UK ethos of national agencies and policing working together as one to target cyber threats, because it's what the threat demands, and in the current resourcing context and financial context, it's absolutely what we need to do to be most efficient and most effective. We all have a part to play if the system is to work. The model's proven its worth time and time again, and disruptions against cyber are uh, at a record high. Uh, and indeed, we've been able to deliver arrests in seven out of 10 of the most serious incidents that hit the country between October and April, um, October last year and April this year. There's a long way to go. However, the picture at a local level is far less reassuring. Of the two million cyber-dependent crimes that are estimated to be taking place, only 28,000 were reported to action fraud last year. Only around 3,500 of these were disseminated from NFIB. Only 12% of those have been investigated at a local level. So in reality, when you look back at that 12 million, there's a tiny proportion of cybercrime hitting victims that is being investigated. No wonder, as a recent review of specialist cyber capability found, only a quarter of forces have a dedicated cyber capability. And, the sur and surveys show that ultimately the public's confidence in the law enforcement response to cyber lags far behind other traditional crime types. And worryingly, national prevention campaigns are reaching only about 8% of people in our local communities. So how do we address this? Today, Pete Goodman is at the a subcommittee of the MPCC setting forward options for uh, expanding this integrated model to the local force level uh, with new cyber capabilities developed locally but as part of a regional integrated system. But I need to enlist your help in that. That's a formal answer and a, a policy answer, which will make a big difference if we can come to some agreement. But I need your help on a personal level um, to deliver this, to agitate, to innovate, to push hard for this uh, responsibility in your force area with your seniors, with your PCCs, with your officers, and to champion it yourselves. And you won't be doing it alone. We've built this system uh, and we've taken it so far, particularly at a national and regional level. We've invested some of the government's uh, funds from the National Cyber Security Programme in order to build a backbone of domestic connectivity with enhanced data platforms for sharing forensic material and seized media between the national and regional level using NUIX. We built specialist capabilities at the center, for instance, into Bitcoin chain analysis and, and malware analysis, which are held centrally in the NCA, but available to the whole of policing. An international cyber network that you can leverage, industry specials held in the NCA, more investment in skills and pathways, more functionality in the action fraud reporting system that's being delivered. So there's a lot of investment happening as part of this team effort, and we will continue to do whatever we can to support you in delivering the local response to this challenge. So what exactly does that look like? There are a few scenarios here um, of what the local capability needs to, uh, needs to deliver and what you need to challenge yourself uh, against. So actually, the same questions that you would apply to traditional crime probably apply in these scenarios. What was the weapon? Was it malware? Was it ransomware? Was it DDoS? What was the method of entry? Has the system been hacked? Where are the fingerprints? Is there unusual internet traffic pointing to some strange IPs coming from the infected computer? Has anything been taken? Has any data been exfiltrated from the computer? Is the property now secured? Has the person got locks on their windows and doors? Are they using up-to-date antivirus programs and patching their systems? So I'm not saying all your officers need to be able to do this, but they need to understand what we're talking about and they need to know where to go to get the help. So this is a ransomware attack, for instance. Um, this type of crime encrypts businesses' information um, and stops them from doing their business, may drive them under. It's a more appealing way for criminals, as I've said, to attract funds and raise money. 
So some businesses are beginning to stockpile Bitcoin in anticipation of being attacked by ransomware. And we absolutely cannot allow that to become the norm. We cannot allow that to be an acceptable position. Um, when this crime is reported or disseminated to you, we have to take every step to engage the victim, to offer advice, to look at forensic opportunities, um, to identify perpetrators. We have Bitcoin capability that we can provide to assist in that. Many encryption keys for ransomware are already known and are available on the internet. If you refer to Action Fraud or to the National Cyber Security Centre, there's much we can do to help those victims. However, the reality is there is a, massive under, um, a massively um, low level of investigation into ransomware when you look at what is actually the most reported cyber-dependent crime into Action Fraud. Uh, DDoS is the equivalent of criminal damage. It can put a company out of business in hours. Do your 101 call handlers uh, know what a DDoS is? Would they know how to signpost the victim? And this is a network intrusion. This is even uh, trickier. Having suffered a network intrusion and data breach, a local business might seek an investigative response. Would your officers be equipped to deal with this? to collect the forensic material and preserve evidence? Not every officer is a um, is a murder detective, but they all know not to trample over a murder scene. Do all your officers know how to do that in the context of a cyber crime scene? Underreporting is a huge problem, as we've heard, but unless these crimes are receiving the right kind of victim response, it's not surprising the public may not take the time to report the crime. So um, finally, um, the challenge is stark, and it's my ask, and it's the ask of Chief Constable Peter Goodman, um, that we all step up to the mark. That means at a national level, improving our reporting capability and improving our leading uh, and our support and coordination that we provide from national agencies. It means regionally operating in a flexible and agile way across borders. And it means at a local level, in your forces, you must push hard to build, the de to build and deliver the response to your victims in the context of this threat. So I'm asking you to consider these questions, and if you can't ask them, answer them confidently, to go forth and agitate, to return to your force area, raise this risk, and challenge the culture that it's acceptable to say, no, sorry, I'm just not very tech savvy. That is no longer a tenable position for officers uh, or for senior officers in UK law enforcement. And the opportunity is now. We are a team, um, we've built, particularly at a national and regional level, a team with investment to tackle this threat, and we can work together now to address it before the threat becomes ever more complex and the challenge becomes ever harder. Um, so these are my contact details. I'd ask you to reach out to me, to uh, your regional teams, um, to build relationships and be an advocate for change that ensures that you and your force will remain relevant in the face of 21st century crime. Thank you very much. OK, so I'm, going to, um, I'm just going to skip my slides for a moment because I, I want to tell you a story. Let me tell you about my experience with Action Ford. Okay. Why well, is this fresh in my mind? And this is me talking as, a, as an individual, as part of the, the public, right? as part of the community, not as a cybersecurity expert or advisor or whatever tagline you want to put. Uh, I myself was the victim of fraud, somewhat ironically, twice. And uh, it was really annoying. And when it happened, uh, I, uh, I said, okay, I said to the bank, can you tell me more info? No, sir, we can't do that. Uh, policies. Okay, fine. So I called up Action Fraud. And I uh, reported this to them and said, what are you going to do about it now? And said, well, we're going to log it in our system. OK, what's the next step of action? Um, they couldn't answer. Right? They couldn't tell me. So I uh, said, well, screw this. I'm going to go and investigate it myself. And that's exactly what I did. I went and spoke to the merchant who uh, these items were purchased from and uh, said to them, can you tell me some more info? And he gladly gave me info because they were getting hit every single day with this stuff. So uh, he gave me info of where it was being delivered, who ordered it, uh, the IP address, all these things. And I tracked the person down. I knew when they were going to be picking this item up from the drop location. I knew uh, what time, uh, what the exact location was. Um, I, I knew the person's identity. I knew everything about this person. So, okay, cool. Let's go back to Action Ford. So I went back to Action Ford and I gave them this live intel. And uh, they said, thank you very much, sir. We will log that. 
Okay, fine. So then I spoke to City of London Police and uh, said to them, hey, there's a, a crime that's about to be committed, that's about to be in progress. Uh, I would very much like it if you could deal with this, please. Um, to which their response was, no. They refused to act on that live intel. So I actually called up Argos in the end. Right? These are the people where the item was being collected from, their newfangled drop points where you can just go in without ID to go and collect an item. And I said to them, hey, there's someone who's coming in to come and pick up a fraudulently purchased item. Can you please detain them so the police have time come down and arrest them. They said they are not willing to put their staff in a position uh, that would be harmful to them. Therefore, the person walked in. Everyone knew that he, this person was committing a crime, picked up his parcel, and walked the hell back out. That was my experience with action fraud. Do I think it's working? Hell no. All right. um, so, on that positive note, I will continue. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm named, my name's Cal Leeming. I'm a cybersecurity advisor. I've spent 10 years building startups in Silicon Valley, tons of failures, a couple of successes, which is always good. Uh, four of those years I've spent as an independent uh, law enforcement advisor, um, typically to regional organized crime units, uh, DMIs, these kind of things. Uh, two of those years I spent doing youth work, so this is going into schools, um, done a bit of work with the NCA prevent team, uh, trying to find out why is it that kids seem to want to get into this stuff. And we already know why, but you know, it was more sort of validating it from there. Uh, and today I, I run a company called Lions Leaming, which is a cyber protection and risk management firm. Um, some of the work I've done in recent times and some work coming up, uh, UK Security Expo, a keynote there, which is pretty cool, GovNet, 2,000 or so public sector employees, again, talking about these same things, about how we can protect businesses, UK Innovate, which is more aligned with the startup work. Featured on TV a couple of times, got my ass handed to me a couple of times on TV as well. All the usuals, and Vice Magazine, which was one of the more interesting ones. So, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me as a as, as personality, right? Because I feel like you know, it's good to, to understand the person who's on the stage. Uh, I like to destroy hard drives the old fashioned way with a healthy amount of sodium hydroxide. If anyone recovers data from these drives, they bloody deserve it. Okay, and that's a, that's a close up. Right, and so nothing's coming off those drives, I'm telling you, it's a very good effective method. Um, I might spend a bit of time at the range as well. Sadly, it's not an activity, activity you can really partake in the UK, but it's good in the US. Um, I, I'm trying to get my PPL, but I'm terrified of flying, so that doesn't really help very much. Uh, I can't do stalls, they, they, they scare me too much. Uh, and I do a little bit of amateur photography in my spare time as well. So I grew up uh, as a kid of the 90s uh, with the AOL CDs. I mean, you used to have to pay for dial-up. And uh, I first discovered the internet by using my Nan's credit card to purchase uh, an AOL subscription after also borrowing a modem from a friend. And boy, did I get in trouble for that. But it was a good eye-opener. I learned about this new thing called the internet, and it was fascinating. Discovered something called IRC. Some of you may or may not be aware of this, but this is still around today. It's just a, it's just a, cha a chat room system. A little less popular than it was uh, back in the 90s, but still around. Um, it was through IRC that I started meeting uh, like-minded individuals of my age, by the way. Uh, and at this age, I would have been 10 years old. Right, so, very young, um, and uh, I did all the things you'd expect at that, that time. So I used Napster to download music, right, uh, yeah, as, as you do. And this is how old I was. This is a picture of me, I think, when I was maybe nine, just before ten, maybe. Um, and that's how old I was when I was, uh, when I was doing hacking and doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing. Right, so very, very, very young, looking back at it, one day covered in mud and the next a uh, cyber criminal. Crazy. Um, eventually, uh, my, my antics got me kicked out of school. Uh, that, that, that sucked. Um, and then, after several years of uh, committing the, these, uh, the, these acts of crime, uh, breaking into various ISPs, and just generally pissing a lot of people off, uh, the, the police came and kicked down my door, understandably. Um, that, was a, that was a traumatic experience as well. Um, after that, uh, went into a horrible situation of uh, got held by drugs from the age of 13 to 16. Um, thankfully managed to get away from that after, after being rescued from it, but uh, I'm very lucky to be alive today. I, I actually shouldn't be alive right now. Um, eventually went into the custody of my grandparents who tried to teach me you know, the, the right ways to do things. Like, don't, don't do this. Just, just go and get a job. Be normal like everyone else. 
that wasn't going to happen. And I went on a run for about two and a half years, uh, committing more crime, committing more fraud. Ended up, um, it was about £750,000 worth of money laundering in the end, along with computer misuse. And this guy, Clive Reed, is my investigating, or was my investigating officer. Um, I was hoping Clive was going to be here today, but like a fool, I didn't invite him in time, and he wasn't able to, uh, to be here today. So, um, but I want to tell you a little bit of a story about Clive, because this is important. This guy is the reason I'm stood here today. Right? This, this investigator is why I'm stood here. He, from the moment that uh, he tracked me down, he gave me two options. He said, Cal, you can either hand yourself in and, uh, and you know, you'll, you'll go to jail for a little bit. Someone's got to go to jail. Uh, or I'm going to put you all over crime watch. Okay, so it forced my arm a little bit, but uh, even, even, uh, even to the point where he handed me over to the court system, um, he was very respectful and he seemed like he genuinely wanted to help me, and that's what he did. And after I got out of prison, uh, which I got 15 months for, for my crimes, I was looking at seven years. This guy stopped me getting seven years, so I'm very thankful for that, along with my lawyer. Um, he, uh, he put me back in front of the people that I hacked into, some of the banks that I'd breached, and uh, I helped them secure their systems. And to this day, I still still talk to, to this guy every couple of months, right? You know, uh, he's, um, this is, he is one of the, he, this, he's the reason why I have a bit of a soft spot for law enforcement and why I, I get involved with, with, with helping in law enforcement as an independent advisor, because I, I see him as being the, the, the future way of how we should do policing, which is working with the community as opposed to just solely enforcing law. Uh, and that's, that's my own personal opinion. I say, went to prison for a little bit, and, uh, and now I'm stood here today. So um, I won't talk too much about my background, because we're already going a little bit over. Um, so why I'm here today. Uh, I met Gavin. Uh, this was about oh, a year or, yeah, about a year ago. Um, he did an article online, I'm sure many of you may remember this, where he suggested that, um, he didn't say they should be fitted, he, says they should, uh, he suggested that they should be fitted with uh, Wi-Fi jammers, the uh, cyber criminals, to stop them from being able to use the internet. And he got an absolute slating complete slating from the, from the uh, techno, technical community. Uh, everyone said, oh, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, hold on, hold on, we're being, being a bit harsh here. Like, you know, he's, at least he's stood up and said, like, at least he's doing something. At least he's put something on the table, a different idea, a different way of thinking, just um, you know, rather than just being complacent about it. Um, so anyway, I, I, uh, when the media asked me about it, I said, well, it's not going to work, <laughs> but I have to commend the fact that he had, uh, you know, he had the, 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 the courage to actually go against the community and, and say what he thought and at least put something out there. Uh, and that's how we met and got talking, and he very uh, kindly invited me to this event today. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the issues that we've seen out in the field. Um, so a little bit of background. I've trained, uh, I think, three regional uh, forces now uh, in terms of helping to catch cyber criminals, uh, extending their capabilities to um, uh, to use uh, the word cyber uh, it, uh, in, in a more positive way and use it to, to help their day-to-day -day job. And one of the big issues that's come back is that, yes, there are um, uh, agencies like the NCA, NCCU, NCSC that are doing fantastic work, absolutely fantastic work, and I commend them for that work, and it's, it's definitely a step in the right direction, as, as we were discussing yesterday. Um, the, the problem is that there's, there's not enough of it. Right? Because there's so much demand for the service that the regional forces are left um, in, in, unable to, uh, to get the support that they need. And this is precisely what Ollie was saying earlier, right? is that we need to extend those capabilities so that the regional forces have the ability to, uh, to, to deal with issues themselves, rather than being told, sorry, we can't help with that particular case because um, we, we, we don't have the resources right now, or, you know, or uh, you know, it's not a serious enough case to warrant it, therefore, you know, you're just going to have to deal with it yourself. Um, but when the system does work and when it does go through and when the support is there, it's been fantastic. You, know, you look at the work that the NCSC has done, you look at the work that the NCA has done, sure, okay, there's a few maybe overzealous individuals that have given the, the, you know, the service a bad name, but in, in total, it's actually been a really positive step forward and, uh, and I, I hope it will continue that way. Um, so that's one of the, sh the pain points that we're hearing in the field from investigators uh, and from regional forces. Uh, the second is a shortage of talent. 
Uh, hiring within the police force is uh, it's, it's, it's an issue, right? especially regionally. Um, you've got the pay grading system, which isn't helping matters. Uh, the, the, the reason that you end up not being able to hire the right people, yeah, it's because you have to be very patriotic to say, I'm going to take a six or seven times uh, cut in salary to go and work for my local force. It's, it's not going to happen. Um, yeah, you've got more chances of those good people going and being uh, NCA specials, right? Um, so instead, what regional forces are having to do, they're having to ch train the skills in-house, right? They, they get their own officers, identify the ones that want to increase their uh, career options, and then train them. The problem with that is they are being trained trained with outdated material. Right? So you look at some of the material that's going out to them, and it's like five, six, seven years out of date. And some ones are only a year out of date, but the technology is moving so fast that even that is too old for them. So um, that, that's another pain point, and lack of resources as well. One of the forces that, that we did some training for, um, they were having issues with phones being wiped after they'd been confiscated. So they go into the evidence locker, and then they go back to, you know, to go and uh, look at it forensically. And say, oh, it's been wiped. So like, why wasn't it in a Faraday bag? The force couldn't afford Faraday bags. Why is that even an issue? Right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy, um, but that's the situation we live in. Um, and the third is the criminalization of children. Now, this is a very um, close topic to my heart. We have seen far too many instances of uh, very curious, um, very talented young individuals being subjected to the criminal justice system unnecessarily. These individuals could have quite easily been dealt with in the community, they could have quite easily been dealt with by their schools, um, uh, with youth workers, but instead their curiosity is, uh, is effectively ruining their lives. And uh, I think that's wrong. It's plain and simple, I think it's wrong. There are some individuals, yes, that do need to be subjected to that system because they, they just won't change without it. I was one of them, right? So we do need punishment in there. Do we really need to be punishing a 15, 16 year old kid that didn't really understand what he was doing and could actually be using those skills for better, but instead we've now given them criminal records so they can never have that chance to go and do something for their society on the bigger picture? Hmm. Yeah. Each to their own opinion. So um, the, that's the third problem. And again, that's not just my own personal opinion. That's also what I'm hearing out in the field. I'm hearing uh, officers with quite, um, what's the word here? They, uh, they, they don't struggle to enforce the law, but they, they, they struggle with the ethics behind it. You know, they see a very vulnerable child in front of them, and you know, they're like, why, you know, why can't we just help this kid? Why have I got, now got to go and crime this? You know, it's ridiculous. So that's some of the frustrations. Uh, and the fourth side is, um, that how technology is kind of weaving its tentacles into everything we do, right? Uh, drones, as an example, look at the effect that's had on the prison service, right? Um, that has caught, because of the influx of drugs and weapons into, um, into the prison service, that has now actually caused an increase in deaths, right? An increase, increase in violence, and then you combine that with uh, you know, the decrease in resources that the prison service already has, yeah, that's an issue, right? Um, and, and drones is a big part of that, right? And it's like, why, why have we not done something about this already? There's there's all these high-tech things of, oh, we can shoot drones out of the sky, we can get eagles to go flying after them. Yeah, okay, or we could just put a massive net over the building and be done with it, right? Yeah, there's all different ways of solving the problems, uh, <laughs> but um, nothing really seems to be getting done very quickly, and, and that's what's quite frustrating for, 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 for many within the service. Um, then you have uh, autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, I, I don't even want to contemplate what happens when that gets, uh, when that gets hacked. Um, it's, it's going to be bad. Uh, same with critical national infrastructure as well. Um, we've done some demonstration attacks uh, where we found vulnerabilities in water supplies, for example, where you think, well, what's the worst you could do? Well, you could decrease the uh, level of chlorine going into the water and the level of uh, other chemicals going into the water, and then uh, change the sensors, as an example, uh, to show uh, that the chlorine levels are still okay. Right? And then what happens? Bacteria spreads. So infection spreads and, uh, and then people start going to hospital, it, it's a bad situation. And you think, well, how feasible is that? Come and spend a day in our lab and I'll show you how feasible it is. Um, you have uh, encrypted messaging apps. Uh, I've spoken on many occasions about this uh, on, on BBC Radio where there's always the argument of, well, why can't the government just decrypt everything? And I say, well, 
uh, as someone who helps train investigators, there is no doubt that having that ability would help. It would save lives. Uh, there is no doubt that um, the government already has the capabilities of attacking um, certain messaging apps in certain situations at the right time, uh, but they are, you know, they're, they're not a matter of course. Um, it's more for specific situations. Um, the problem, however, is that if we, uh, if we, if we weaken it for the majority, uh, sorry, weaken it for the minority, we weaken it for the majority, therefore there isn't really a solution. Right? And I say, well, if there isn't a solution, what are we meant to do? So, well, if there was an easy answer to that problem, it would already be solved. Right? That's why we're having this conversation. Um, what are you meant to do regionally when you encounter someone using an encrypted messaging service and you haven't got authority to go and deploy malware onto that phone to go and uh, look at the messages? Don't know. Right? You, you could. You could yeah, you, you just don't know. Right? There's, there's not really many options to you, and that's frustrating. And that's why I probably couldn't be an investigator, because I would say to myself, well, hold on, this person's breaking the law, this person's potentially going to hurt someone. Um, I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to, to get into their communications and find out what they're doing. But no, you're not allowed to do that, because you have to uh, abide by the rules and the regulations, and you have to go through certain checks and measures. So it's very frustrating. Um, you have the darknet aspect as well. Some of the things for sale on there are just like, it, it's a different game now. Uh, yeah, people selling other people, you know, it's, it's, it's awful. Uh, and then social media as well. Um, you've got this influx now of young individuals uh, selling drugs via social media, you know, using Instagram and taking pictures of stuff. And, and then you say, well, why aren't the social media companies doing more to fight that? And when you report images to them and they don't do anything about it, you know, who's, who's responsible for that? Is it the force? Is it the technology companies? Is it society in general? It, 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 there's all sorts of answers. So these are the problems that I'm hearing from the field. These are the problems and, and my own interpretation of them. Um, I don't have any easy answers. If I had any easy answers, I'd be giving them to you now as well. Um, my role here today is to convey the message about what I'm hearing out in the field so that you can, can hear it firsthand, right? Because a lot of the time, you don't get um, honest feedback internally within the service, right? Because it, it, people are afraid of affecting their career path within the service, right? So as someone who's external to all this, I can see what I damn well like, right? And I don't have to worry about my career progression because I'm not in the service. Um, so uh, my, my role is to just get that across and to help, um, uh, help spread the message of what's happening on the ground. Um, so that's it. I'm going to end a minute early, so you've got a minute extra to ask questions. And do please ask questions, otherwise we're going to be staring at each other for quite some time. So thank you. Thank you both. I've got lots of questions, but this is my question list on the app at the moment. It says ask a question, no question submitted yet. So we're going to have to have a lot of questions from the hall because I want to send you all off sort of invigorated and, and happy. So I'll kick things off and then I'll go to the, the hall. So get your questions ready now. Um, Oliver, I wanted to start with you just to ask you to be blunt. Cal's being quite blunt. I'll ask him to be even blunter in a minute. Um, but do you think that the police are getting their priorities right in terms of traditional cr focusing on traditional crime uh, versus cyber crime in terms of resources, expertise, all of that? Uh, no. So I think I, I don't want to be in a position where I'm saying um, it's, ju it's just a local problem. It's about the forces and that's it because it isn't. It's about a system response. But I do think there is a specific issue, which uh, I know Peter Goodman agrees on, which is about the, the response being given to victims in forces when it comes to cybercrime. That there are not the skills, there are not the capabilities, there's not the knowledge there in adequate volume to deal with what we are seeing. And that in effect, people who are victims of these kind of devastating crimes are not, are not receiving the service that they should be from police forces. I think deliver achieving that has to be a collective response. Um, and we've gone some way in doing it at a national and regional level, but we need to support um, the building of that at a local level as well. So what do you think about Sarah Thornton's suggestion a while back to you know, maybe not visit someone after a burglary, burglary and put some of that resource into cybercrime instead? Would that be money well spent? So yeah, I mean, there's choices, aren't there? But, um, but what's your choice in that situation? 
So I think that there, I think it's about efficiency of resources. I'm dodging your question slightly. You are. That. I'm not going to let you dodge the question because I haven't got many questions well, on this app at the moment. In fact, I haven't got any still. I think we need to put more resource into dealing with cybercrime and that will have to come from somewhere. Um, I do think we need to put more resource into it because... There, but prioritise that over other traditional if, if crimes? If you look at public satisfaction with traditional crimes like burglary, the, the law enforcement response, like burglary, it is significantly higher than the response to cyber crimes. So do you think you can sell that to the public to say, we're not going to send an officer around after your burglary necessarily because we want to put that officer onto a cyber crime So case. I think before we get to that point, we need to make sure we've exhausted the smart solutions to how we work together to use our resources efficiently because there are ways which we can deal with those victims um, efficiently without a massive demand on a whole load new, of new resources. That's the premise of the um, one, some of the options. One of the options that Peter's talking to the council about the, the subcommittee today is investment in that team cyber approach. So investment um, of a, a nationally networked capability. So you can use the regional, the regional hubs. So you can use the existing protect network. So there is a network across regions um, accessible to you of protect officers who could be working with your victims. Um, are we using them as much as we could be? There is a network being built of prevent officers across the country to help you know, deter young people from getting involved. Are we really exhausting all of those, um, all of those capabilities? And are we using at least the resource we've got to respond to cyber in the same way we'd respond to anything else? Because that is what the public expect. And before I shift on to Cal, I mean, I was pretty shocked by um, his tale of his own fraud experience. But I wasn't surprised, given that, you know, I've had a similar sort of frustration yeah. with a stalking case that I literally presented on a plate to the police. And it was about a year later that it finally uh, got some action on. Um, so are you surprised, depressed by that? What, what went wrong there? I am not surprised. Um, and I think that um, part of the reason that reporting is low is because the victim experience isn't good enough and part of the reason is because the experience of reporting to action fraud is not good enough. But it's baffling, isn't it, that he presented an opportunity to the police to just show up and... So it's... Well, so the fact we have a national portal to try and... Um, before focusing entirely on all the negatives. The fact we have a national reporting for, uh, portal for cyber is more advanced than most other European countries. It's who no do, good if it doesn't do, do anything, not. though. It does something. It is a, it, it is a start. Um, it is a start. It's recognised it needs to be improved, and that's why there's continued investment into it. Um, if we don't have that and that doesn't work, it's going to be very difficult to make progress because why invest... And this comes back to your point on efficiency and resources. Why investigate a 1,000 ransomware attacks across the country individually if you've got an effective way at the centre of collecting those reports, analysing them and realising that one ROCQ or one force can do it by themselves? And we've satisfied all of those victims because there is one investigation. So, no, I'm not surprised. It needs to improve. Um, Cal, what, in this age of constrained resources, what is the single thing that you think police forces could do to up their game in this area? Okay, so one of the forces we did some work with uh, a couple of months ago uh, had a situation where they didn't really know what advice to give businesses. Right? They, 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 they weren't aware of what advice to give businesses. So um, when we told them, this is some of the things you can say and this is some of the ways you can go, said, ah, well, actually, we can't do that. And they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't give specific recommendations to businesses calling up and to businesses who, who had been a, a victim of crime because uh, they had to be seen to be impartial. So, for example, if there was one vendor who is known to be solving this fantastic problem and they're, they're leaders in that industry, they can't recommend them. Uh, and if there's local businesses that are willing to help, they can't recommend them either. It has to go through a whole massive tendering process and then there's all things of you know, being endorsed by the police and all sorts of horrible issues. So, by its very nature, the police service cannot give um, actionable um, tasks to businesses that are a victim of this, which is... Um, yeah, that's a problem. 
That's, <laughs> and, and, uh, quite, and quite a few businesses that uh, had been subjected to that with that force had shown frustration, hence why they called us in to see if there was any other ways. But sadly, we said, well, you need to be giving direct recommendations. There are things that they can go and take away and, and implement today. But by doing that, they would have lack of impartiality. And um, yeah, how do you fix that? <laughs> and you've developed this career out of, you know, get, advising people on, you know, how to thwart people like your former self. Um, is that part of the answer, do you think, Oliver, that you hire, the police hire younger employee, employees, former hackers? Is that a good solution? I think we have to, um, we do have to mix up the skill set we've got and think more creatively, absolutely. Um, I think that's about who we recruit, and you know we suffer as much as anyone else in the NCA from the uh, shortage of investigators. Interestingly, um, it's a shortage of traditional investigative skills that we really suffer from, even more than the technical skills. We actually can bring technical people in. You can either, either directly or through, we have a lot of volunteers, cyber specials, or industry partnerships who bring that technical knowledge and work with us on our investigations and with uh, regional uh, capability. However, um, they will come and then they will go. They will come for a couple of years, then they will move on to another career. Watching people who've worked in law enforcement a long time and um, them adapt to the fact people will come and then they will go, and that cultural change has been quite interesting. Uh, we have to adapt to that. Um, but it's actually the invest it's having the investigative capability that sits next to that technical knowledge. That's what you need together. Um, but having that investigative capability is very difficult to retain. But that isn't a problem just for cyber. That's across the whole, the whole piece. Um, but no, we have to think creatively. And I think at a local level, there will be relationships with industry you can form that will help you with your response. Academics and universities in your area that will have research here. Um, there are approved uh, cybersecurity. Uh, companies with the National Cyber Security Centre that uh, industry and victims can use if they need help. And um, I am getting some questions on the app now. I've got a question here. I'll go to you first and then I'm going to come back to one that I want to ask myself. So yeah, just over here. Thanks. Uh, Sean Wilson from the Met Police. I have a question to both of you really. We've got a lot of youngsters coming to the organisation now who are very technically savvy. And Cal, dare I say, you remind me of many of the youngsters I've got on uh, within our own command. What is available, and it's something that um, one of you said is how almost having like that digital crime scene. So what is available either through the NCA or through private industry, Cal, from your side of the business or from yours, uh, Oliver, what is available for us to be able to give to frontline officers as a package and obviously needing to be regularly updated? Because I'm not sure there's that much out there. Cal, uh, Yeah, um, so a little bit of background about me. Um, for the past nine years, I've spent protecting uh, individuals and families uh, on a personal level. So this is something we've had to deal with over and over and over again. Um, there are some very good vendors out there. Um, come ask me afterwards and I'll, I'll give you the names of the vendors. Um, there's uh, some fantastic tools, but there is a very basic lack of training in terms of capturing evidence, right? So don't pull the power on the machine. Um, don't go interacting with the machine. Um, if you need to keep the machine alive, get someone, get one officer whose del whose actual job, only job for that particular scene is to move the mouse around the screen. <laughs> That's it. And even then, you have anti forensics tools that will monitor for that kind of thing. Um, there's there's all sorts of training programs you can go on. There's 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 that there is possible to solve that problem. The difficulty is that these courses and these tools and these techniques are very expensive, right? And, um, and the forces just don't have the, the, the resources to, to buy it. I mean, we spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds every single, um, every single year just training people on the latest techniques. And this is a, this is a burn for us. Why we don't make any money from it, but we have to keep up. Now, how, how can we expect every single force to then do the same when they're, you know, our team's only, what, um, 10, 20 people, right? I mean, you've got, a force, you've got a force of hundreds, if not thousands of officers. How the hell are you meant to keep up with that based on current budgetary constraints? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so well, it's an extended answer. So. There's that old story of the officer that, in order to preserve evidence, pulled the plug out of the computer and then put a tape, uh, put a, you know, <laughs> tape around it. I think you told me that one, Gavin. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> we've come a long way. Um, so, 
yeah, there is a, school, a shortage. It comes back to this economies of scale point that, that those are the same skills that your officers will need that we have had to develop in the national capability and develop in the regional. So actually, what we don't, there are government funds there. There's another round of bidding for the National Cybersecurity Programme. There's no guarantee that that kind of requirement would secure that funding. But I can tell you one thing, that if there is a common voice, a, joint, a joined up voice, national, regional, and from chief constables and from you, saying, we need this, we cannot investigate this crime surge in your constituency, hitting your constituents, Minister, unless you fund us to go on this training. We'll do it together, we'll go on training courses together, we'll do it efficiently, but you need to do it for us because we can't investigate otherwise. There is a lack of that voice coming from the local area at the moment. So please kind of contact me, contact us, and let's talk about how we can join forces on that with the College of Policing and try and deliver something. And Cal, we were talking last night about ransoms, um, and I want to come to you second because um, Easy. <laughs> I don't want to preempt Oliver. Um, what you you said, Oliver, that you can't allow it to become the norm that businesses are stockpiling bitcoins. Are you saying that individuals and businesses should never pay a ransom to? protect their data, their naked pictures or whatever. Not that I have any naked pictures, can I just say? I'm just adding that hastily, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm walking into a, a trap slightly, but I, yeah. Yeah. Ab yeah. absolutely, I would say, do not pay the ransom because the entire business model is built on the idea that people will pay the ransom. What was interesting about some of the more recent high profile attacks is that the actual, the money infrastructure behind it uh, didn't work. So even if you paid the ransom, you would not, the criminal would not know and would not be able to send you the decryption key. Quite helpful in destroying the trust, funny word, but trust in the criminal to honour their transaction, their, their, their role in this, this model. But I think what's, again, kind of before you get to that point, the reason it's the message is don't just pay the ransom straight away is before you get to that point, if we've got an effective policing and prevention advice to that victim, the key, the encryption key, might be available already on things like No More Ransom, which is a joint platform with Europol. They might be out there, there might be things you can do, and actually people should be taking steps to protect that in the first place and prepare for those attacks to stop having to pay the ransom. We have to kill that business model. Cal, I know that you think differently. Do oh, share. you set me up good for this one. You're good. I didn't drink that Do much I get one last night. Reverse next. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, all right. Um, yeah. This is this is something we have to deal with on an almost weekly basis. Um, is cyber extortion? Typically for us, it's uh, naked photos, emails, um, sent to things that would destroy careers. This kind of stuff, and they want money right, to to stop that being leaked. And uh, typically, uh, we send in a, a host, an ex-hostage negotiator. Um, the ex-IDF people are very good as well at that. Uh, and we send them in, and they build up a rapport with the people that are extorting uh, our clients. And uh, we agree a price that will be paid. And they pay the ransom. And Oliver, um, that's a problem for you, isn't it? Um, well, it's a problem for everyone, because... Um, the, the, not in those individual circumstances where we, you know, it's about protecting the victim. But when you step back from this problem and look at it, if this business model makes money, it will continue and it will get worse as it has done. Um, the, the best we can do is to work together to, 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 to limit the proceeds, to reduce the gains by encouraging people to uh, better prepare themselves and to at least check to see whether they could get out of this without paying the ransom. And I'm not sure that level of protect and prevention advice from policing is happening. A um, couple of questions from the app for each of you, one for each of you. Um, Cal, no, I'm going to ask this to Oliver. Should and could the internet providers do more? I've been chatting to people who are quite incensed by the slow progress of, you know, Facebooks and Twitters and so on. Do you think, should they be taking more responsibility? So we've, we've got good relationships with the internet service providers uh, in terms of sharing bulk victim information with them. So us and the National Cyber Security Centre share with them you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of, of credentials of victims. They are then able to warn their customers that they may be the victim of compromise. So we see quite good and improving collaboration from them. 
Um, in terms of uh, the likes of Facebook and others, I think, you know, it's more a kind of political question, really, but the government set out a fairly clear view that they do expect more activity, especially when it comes to extremist material, to, to happen. And um, I'll probably leave it there. Cal, when it comes to cybercrime, should the online companies be doing more themselves, or is it basically over to the police? Um, yes, they should be doing more. Um, I think there's too much expectation on the police, to be honest, uh, not just in cybercrime, but in society in general. Um, I think that there should be more work in the community to solve these problems rather than relying on law enforcement to solve what is effectively a civil matter. And finally, very quick question, where is cybercrime being investigated well? Which country leads the way and what can we learn from them? Oliver. Um, so, by all standards, we do it pretty well as a, as a country compared to others. Um, it's in Europe, particular partners we've got that do it well. So the Dutch have a, have a good model where they, few, they sit, as I described, sit a technical expert, buddy them up with an investigator so that you've got those different mindsets working together. Um, and of course, the US uh, do it very well and are tenacious and relentless in their pursuit of kind of upstream criminals. Um, uh, but their resources are fairly significant as well. But we work very closely with them because, interestingly, um, the criminals that we face in the Five Eyes group between us, the US, European partners, often they're the same criminals who are attacking us and we need to club together to work against them. Cal, do you agree with those com countries mentioned? Um, well, I'm biased because I spent 10 years building startups in the valley, so I'm naturally going to say uh, that, the, that California is way, well, the US in general is way, way, way ahead. Um, the UK is lacking in terms of technical ability, uh, in terms of innovation. Um, that's my biased opinion. Um, and we also get quite a lot of good people and good technology out of Israel as well. So those, I would say, are the two most upcoming at the moment, or the two most prevalent at the moment.